Well, good morning, friends. I want to invite you to come on in and find a seat. Welcome to worship here at Holland UCC. So glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, whether you're here in person at the Civic Center, congrats. You navigated your driveway and the slippery parking lot out here. Uh, so glad you're able to be with us. And those tuning in from home, we're glad uh, you're here as well. Hopefully you're comfortably on the couch uh, with something warm in your butt. Well, we are a community that's progressive, engaging, and inclusive, where everyone is welcome to the table. We believe that no matter your tradition or background, how you identify, who you love, or where you are on your journey, you are welcome here in this place. Well, this morning we'll explore the familiar words of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, words perhaps that we've heard many times in our lives, and we'll see uh, if we can dig through some of the layers and, and, and hear uh, some of the power in what Jesus uh, was saying then and is saying still to us today. Well, as we're settling in here to our gathering this morning, we invite you to get comfortable in your seat, take just a moment to seek to be present here and now. Maybe lean back, maybe even close your eyes if that's comfortable, and I invite you to take a deep breath in. Breathing in gratitude for this new day, and breathing out. Breathing in hope, possibility, and peace, And exhale. And as we continue in our mindful breathing, we ring this meditation bowl which reminds us of the deep peace of God. O great spirit, whose voice we hear in the winds and whose breath gives light to all the world, hear us. We are small and weak. We need your strength and wisdom. Let us walk in beauty and make our eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make our hands respect the things you have made, our ears sharp to hear your voice. Make us wise so that we may understand the things you have taught our people. Let us learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. We seek strength, not to be greater than our friends, but to fight the greatest enemy who lies within. Make us always ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes, so when life fades as the fading sunset, our spirits may come to you without shame. <coughs> Amen. But you stand if you're able and join us in our opening song, Come Thou Fount. <laughs> Journey, giving thanks. 
friends. And also with you. Feel free to take a moment and offer a word of peace or just a hello to someone who's near you. I invite you to remain. Oh, I invite you to remain standing if you're able. As we turn to our litany this morning, litany entitled "We Seek Your Face." I'll read the regular type together. We can respond with the bold. Oh God, we come before you in brokenness. We seek your face, a face with eyes that see our pain, with ears that hear our cries with hands that touch our scars and open wounds. We remember those who suffer the effects of economic injustice, especially those who are homeless or living without the basic amenities for health and survival. We pray for those whose voices are suppressed because of their sexual identity, gender, and religious affiliations. We pray for those who tend the earth and struggle to feed others while sustaining themselves when the earth has been poisoned and the climate confused. Turn your face to those suffering ones, the face of your justice, your truth, and the transformative power of your love, acting through our own acts of courage and resistance. Amen, and may it be so. Maybe see it. Our verse for reflection this morning from 1 Corinthians 1.25. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. poem this morning from Denise Lowe entitled Walking with My Delaware Grandfather. Walking home, I feel a presence following and realize he is always there. That native man with coal black hair who is my grandfather. In my first memories, he is present, mostly wordless resident in the house where I was born. My mother shows in the cleft in my chin identical to his. I am swaddled and blinking in the kitchen light. So we are introduced. 
we never part. Sometimes I forget he lodges in my house still, the bone house where my heart beats. I carry his mother's framework, a sturdy structure. I learn his birthright. I hear his mother's teachings through what my mother said of her. She kept a pot of stew on the stove all day for anyone to eat. She never went to church but said you could be a good person anyway. She fed hobos during the 30s, her back porch a regular stopover. Every person has rights no matter what color. Be respectful. This son of hers, my grandfather, still walks the streets with me. Some twist of blood and heat still spark across the time bridge. Hear, listen. Air draws through these lungs made from his. His blood still pulses through this hand. Walking with my Delaware grandfather by Denise Lowe. This time I invite our kiddos, any kindergartners to fifth graders who'd like to join our kids' time. Follow Miss Krista, you'll be just down the hall for a time of lesson, story, and craft. Promises to be a fun time. And while they're making their way, I will invite our reader forward. <clears throat> Words of guidance and uh, guidance, or words of integration and guidance. Howard's in. History is the memory of states, wrote Henry Kissinger in his first book, A World Restored, in which he proceeded to tell the story of 19th century Europe from the, view, from the viewpoint of the leaders of Austria and England, ignoring the millions who suffered from those statesmen's policies. My viewpoint in telling the history of the United States is different. That we must accept the memory of states, we must not accept the memory of states as our own. Nations are not communities and never have been. The history of any country, presented as the history of, of a family, conceals fierce conflicts between conquerors and conquered, masters and slaves, capitalists and workers, dominators and dominated in race and sex. And in such a world of conflict, it is the job of thinking people, as Albert Camus suggested, not to be on the side of the executioners. If history is to be creative, to anticipate a possible future without denying the past, it should, I believe, emphasize new possibilities by disclosing those hidden episodes of the past when, even if in brief flashes, people showed their ability to resist, to join together, occasionally to win. I am supposing, or perhaps only hoping, that our future may be found in the past's fugitive moments of compassion rather than in its solid centuries of warfare. A reading of scripture from Micah 6, 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy within God's, with God's people, and will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you, and what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent you before, I set before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what a king Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal. And may you know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten, thousand, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Thank you, Clint. Love the shirt. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> Sister Andre was a French nun and the world's oldest person. She lived through two world wars and survived not only COVID-19, but the 1918 influenza pandemic. I mean, you can just imagine her in 2020. Here we go. Here we go again. Unbelievable. But she did die recently uh, on January 17 in France. She was 118 years old. Wow. <laughs> Author and researcher Dan uh, Buechner wondered why some societies have higher than average life average lifespan, higher than average lifespan. So he decided to travel the, the world to meet some of the longest lived people on the planet. And I like that phrase, longest lived people, right? Rather than oldest, I don't know. I, I think now, I, now rather than aspire to grow up to be an old person, I want to be a, a longest lived person. Well, what he found was that a lot of Western societies are out of the ordinary and out of step with the rest of the world and how we treat the longest lived among us. One place he went to was Sardinia in Italy. Sardinia is the second largest island in the Mediterranean. And he went there to discover why people here live so long. And if you ask me, it might have something to do with the 2,000 kilometers of coastline, <laughs> the sandy beaches, and a mountainous interior that's crossed with hiking trails. Add to that the temperate climate and the sunshine. I mean, I can understand, right, why people there don't want to die. <laughs> They're already in heaven. <laughs> Pretty good deal. Well, when Dan got there, he learned that not only do people there tend to live longer, but they have a very high, relatively high population of people who are over 100 years old. A lot of centenarians. And so he attributed this after spending some time there, not to the sunshine or the beaches or the relaxed nature of island life, though that certainly didn't hurt, right? But the high number of Sardinian centenarians, try saying that a few times in a row, right? The high number of Sardinian centenarians is due in large part to the fact that older people, longer lived people enjoy a special place in the community. Dan said, here in Sardinia, the older you got, the more social equity you have, not less. The more wisdom you're celebrated for. This, as it turns out, he says, is not only good for your aging parents to keep them close to the family. Research shows it's also good for the children of those families. 
who have lower rates of mortality and lower rates of disease, what's called the grandmother effect. Well, it turns out Sardinia is not alone in this approach. This reverence for longer-lived people seen across wider Italy as well as across the Mediterranean, where it's common for multiple generations to live under one roof in sort of a mutually beneficial arrangement. Grandparents help cook and care for grandchildren while the adult children go off and work, and in return experience this continued sense of purposefulness and connection. This is also true in many Asian countries. In Japan, old age is considered a uh, socially valuable part of life. They even consider old age to be a time of spring or rebirth. I love that thinking, right? When you turn a certain age, sometimes you think, okay, well, I want to stop celebrating these birthdays, you know, at some point. But to think of what does life still hold for this next phase, how, however long that is, I think it's a beautiful uh, sentiment. And an older person there in Japan is referred to as a sen-nin, or wise sage. And similarly, in many Native uh, American cultures, elders are considered the wisdom keepers of the community. Australian writer Pam Morehouse argues that in the non-traditional cultures of the West, we've lost sight of how valuable older folks are. We've got a culture so fixated on work and financial gain that once someone is no longer sort of being productive in the workplace, we imagine their usefulness to the wider community has decreased. And so, what I would say to this is that what a society honors, we've seen societies now that are honoring their elders, what a society honors flourishes, thrives, and adds value to the community. <clears throat> you might be asking, this is interesting stuff, but what does this have to do with the Beatitudes? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> The word that gets repeated in the Beatitudes is blessed. Blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart, etc. And these are usually understood to be Jesus' pronouncement of divine blessing on the groups of people who are embodying the listed characteristics. Biblical scholar Casey Hansen uh, notes that we have to understand these words of Jesus and the value orientation of the ancient Mediterranean world in which they were first uttered. And further, we need to recognize the importance of honor and shame as foundational values in ancient Israelite society. So building on the work of uh, another venerable scholar, Bruce Molina, Hansen notes that honor and shame are the values complex in which all other values have to be grounded and understood. The word in the Greek for blessed, there in the original writings of the gospel, is makarioi, and based off of the Hebrew equivalents and in this larger values context, Hansen says it might be better to translate, instead of blessed are, how honorable are. How honorable are. That's a little different take, right? How honorable are the meek or pure in heart or those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? And I found this, well, I'm getting it myself. Hansen concludes, I would argue that if the Beatitudes are fundamentally expressions of honor, then Matthew 3 to 10 must be interpreted as programmatic value statements, the conditions and behaviors which the community finds as honorable. That's sort of a different reading, but I find this helpful, and in some ways it makes a little bit more sense than trying to mark out conditions of poverty and mourning to be conditions that are blessed. For example, when you're struggling to pay the bills, it seems little consolation that God considers you blessed, right? Great, but I still have to pay the electric or the power's going to be shut off. Or I have to pay the rent or I'll be out on the street, but at least I'm blessed. <laughs> but if instead it meant in our society 
we hold special value for folks who are in certain situations. It means, as we noted with the opening about valuing long-lived people, it provides the grounds for their flourishing because we value them, we see them, we pay attention and step in. And so I found this helpful and you can take it or leave it, but I found it helpful, so I'm gonna share it. <laughs> and if we take this reading and add to it a more modern translation of the Beatitudes, we might come up with something that sounds a bit like this. How honorable are the poor and the oppressed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How honorable are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How honorable are the nonviolent, for they will inherit the earth. How honorable are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be filled. How honorable are the compassionate, for they will receive compassion. How honorable are the contemplative in nature, for they will see God. How honorable are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. How honorable are those who are persecuted for justice's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For me, this helps open up this text, this perhaps overly familiar text, in a new way. And so we've noted that this is to be read in the values context of honor and shame, but so far in this text, at least, we only have the honor part of that mention. Well, there's an interesting corresponding text near the end of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Matthew. Here we have in chapter 5 his opening sermon, so to speak. But in chapter 23, there's a closing sermon or closing address of sorts. In Matthew 5, he's addressing his disciples. In Matthew 23, he's addressing some of his opponents. And there the text begins, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. And so we could read this as, How shameful of you! to block people from the kingdom of heaven. And if you look at the two texts sort of side by side, it's really interesting because there's a correspondence, a sort of inverse to many of the Beatitudes. So instead of saying yours is the kingdom of heaven, you are blocking the kingdom of heaven. Instead of hunger and thirsting for righteousness, Jesus says you outwardly appear righteous. Instead of blessed are the merciful, it is woe to you who neglect mercy. How shameful. Instead of blessed are the pure in heart, it is woe to you who are impure. Instead of calling them children of God, Jesus calls them sons of Gehenna or sons of hell. And instead of being compared to the prophets who were killed, they are called sons of those who killed the prophets. Super fascinating to see these lined up and connected and sort of bracketing Jesus' teaching ministry. And so we have a book end, really, of Jesus giving what we traditionally will call blessings and woes, but perhaps can read with even more insight, considering them as pronouncements of honor and shame. And so as I was thinking about the text this week and this idea of how what we as a society honor flourishes. I heard this story on NPR, and maybe some of you heard this one as well. And the story comes on, the reporter is Layla Fottle. She says, this next story takes a new look at how Americans for more than a decade have been dying younger than people in other developed countries. We want to warn you, she says, this report will discuss suicide. Researchers have attributed the higher death rates in the U.S. to what they call deaths of despair. Drug overdoses, suicide, alcoholic liver disease. She says NPR's Ritu Chatterjee has more. And Chatterjee says back in 2015, two Princeton economists published a study showing that deaths among middle-aged white Americans had risen dramatically between 1999 and 2013. So about a 14-year period, those deaths rose dramatically. But notice what was named in there. Deaths among middle-aged white 
Americans. So we're discussing here premature mortality. The story then brings in uh, Dr. Joseph Friedman, a physician and researcher at UCLA, and Friedman says, it's an age group where ideally no one should die in that age group, at least certainly not from drug overdose and by suicide. Chatterjee says, but when he and his colleagues took a closer look at the data, they realized that these deaths of despair weren't just impacting white communities. Friedman says the whole sort of premise of the deaths of despair idea that this is unique to white communities that didn't really stand up when you took a closer look at the data. Chatterjee says he and his colleagues found that the rise in midlife deaths was much higher actually in American Indian and Native Alaska Native people, but that that group had been left entirely out of the study. Friedman says, in the same period that deaths among white Americans did go up by about 9%, certainly not good, such deaths among Native Americans went up by 30%. Chatterjee says, Friedman's collaborator, Joseph Gaughan, is a psychologist at Harvard. He's also a member of the Ani Grosventre, pardon on the pronunciation, tribal nation of Montana. And Joseph Gaughan then comes into the story and he says, this entire narrative about deaths of despair among white Americans depended on the invisibility, or we might say the erasure of indigenous presence and visibility in those data sets. And he says, and that's a problem. And I think we would all agree. He goes on to say, the recent rise of deaths among white Americans is of course alarming, but the factors driving these deaths have affected American Indian and Alaska Native peoples for much longer. But of course it becomes a story when it impacts the white community. And so that was the story that I heard this week that just struck me in this context of, of reading uh, the, and studying the Beatitudes. And Jesus has shown that in God's kingdom, Ideally, we are to honor those who are on the margins, those who are poor, oppressed, suffering, mourning, striving to make things right. And when we honor or center them, they have a chance at flourishing because they're seen, not invisible, because they're valued, because they're cared for and walked alongside. And what struck me about this uh, story I heard on NPR was not, um, was not only right, the sense of not honoring the Native American and Alaska Native populations, but just not seeing them at all. It just <clears throat> felt awful. The sheer impossibility, not only were they not honored, they weren't even seen in the result, an incredibly high rate of deaths of despair. Let me know the historical realities behind that go back a long ways. And so you can almost hear Jesus saying, woe to you when you shut out the vulnerable. Shame on you. Woe to you when you are blind to and even erase the indigenous presence among you. How shameful. Woe to you when you outwardly appear righteous by waving the flag and talking about freedom and human rights while neglecting mercy and stomping on those who are already struggling. How shameful. Well, back to where we began with honoring our elders. In many African countries, instead of being neglected or made invisible, elders are served first at mealtimes and often serve and act as judges in the community. In fact, there's an old African proverb that says, a village without the elderly is like a well without water. Isn't that cool? That's powerful. And imagine a well without water in a village and the impact that that would have. Right? We would be a blank creek if we didn't have a working well. And they're saying, that's how valuable the elders in our community 
part of us. Wow. So what would happen if we extended that spirit of learning and honor to the kinds of folks Jesus listed in the Beatitudes, right? You have to imagine it would be a societal transformation. Pam Morehouse invites us to look ahead to our own later years. And she says, when we find ourselves walking into the sunset of our own lives, it's unlikely to be the stacks of money we made or the career successes that matter. What will matter is how we spent time side by side with other humans. Learning from each other about what it means to be human in this ever unfolding world. Both as a young person learning from their elders and as an elder passing on their years of knowledge. In the words of Dr. Suzuki, I believe elders with the power of youth and youth with the power and the knowledge of the elders will be an unstoppable force. It's time, says Morehouse, to reshape the way we interact with our elders and see how precious they really are. <clears throat> the bottom line is this, friends. What we honor flourishes. What we honor flourishes. What we ignore or stand in the way of suffers. Blessed and honorable are the peacemakers. Blessed and honorable are those who hunger and thirst for justice and those who prioritize and care for the most vulnerable, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Maybe so. Might you stand if you're able and join us in our song of response, O for the World. Christy, you may be seated. We have opportunity now to give an offering this morning. Reminder that here at Holland UC we're supported solely by the generosity of our members and friends like you. And if you'd like to give an offering this morning, we have a box in the back. We normally have a box in the back. I don't see it. So we'll allow this. I'll empty this out. So afterwards, you can bring your offering forward and place it in the basket. Or you can give online via the Givelify app or our website, hollanducc.org slash donate. And as always, out of God's generosity, we give, asking that God would use these gifts and us to turn our world upside down with love. And I'll bring this to the back, please. Okay, all, all good, all good. We had a lot going on this morning. We got here and they had us set up downstairs for our gathering, so we had to kind of shift gears and, and come upstairs. So we have a time now, friends, to share some things that are happening uh, with us this morning. Things we there's a mic interference yep. issue this morning, so I'm gonna grab one of these. We've got two mics on the same channel and they're fighting. So if you have something you would like to. Have us remember in prayer, 
hold space for or even celebrate, feel free to raise your hand. I'll come around with the mic and folks who are tuning in from home, feel free to post any prayer requests in the comments there. So almost by miraculous accident, um, and in the spirit of honoring uh, differences and challenges among us, uh, Michigan, I recently discovered, has um, a program that they call the Polar Plunge, um, which is in support of the state's Special Olympics program. Um, and I'm absolutely crazy enough to jump in some freezing cold water for a little bit in support of the Special Olympics. So I signed up for that, and uh, I am trying to raise a little bit of money. I don't want to hijack that you're planning on giving to the church. To give to the church. <laughs> Um, no but, but if you're if you're interested in um, supporting me or supporting that program just in general, even if it's not through me directly, then find me uh, after we're done, or uh, find me on in our, our Facebook group, and I'd be happy to share the information with you, um, even if it's just like you enjoy the ideas and you're reading my video. <laughs> so, some may pay extra to see. Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to live stream it. Um, they don't do it here in Holland; they travel around the state and do it, and the nearest one is this weekend. So I'm going to be okay. up there to do that. I think. Uh, beginning of March is when they're when Great. They're well, keep us posted. You can post something in the Facebook group to make it on yeah, absolutely. Thanks for raising awareness, too, for that community. So for the opportunity to do something crazy that will benefit others, we say thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anything going on we can remember in prayer this morning? Hi. Um, my partner, Rebecca, is turning 40 this week. guess 29, but I won't believe you. Well, happy birthday uh, in advance. Uh, that's, a, that's a big one. New decades always feels like a, a, a spring or rebirth. We'll <laughs> so, uh, happy birthday, Rebecca, and for that joy, we say thanks be to God. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Yeah. Same thing, 60, right here. Hey! Happy birthday, Amy, 60. There we go. There we go. <laughs> 60 is the new 40, as they say. Yep. Just thinking in terms of one more uh, beating by police in yep. Memphis, regardless of the call of the police. It just goes to show that we live in this, grow up in this society, you know, the sea in which we swim, that everybody is, is affected. But I think particularly to, for us to be in touch with um, friends of color and so forth, because if it's them, just take one more time, it just hits them extremely yeah. hard, so. And remind me the name of the? Tyree Nichols. Nichols, thank you. So I just think especially of just you know, people of color around Every time it just adds. Yep, it just adds. And I did want to pass along that some friends are holding actually a rally at Centennial Park today for Tyree Nichols to stand in solidarity and call out police violence against communities of color. So it's one o'clock at Centennial Park. So you're invited to join in that uh, if you would like. Well, so for that which was named and for the continued struggle in this country to treat one another with dignity and honor despite our differences. We lift that up to God and say, oh God, Amen. hear our prayers. Anything else going on? Okay. Well, we know, of course, friends, there's more happening in our lives and in our world than we've given voice to. So if there's anything else that you are holding on to, I invite you to lift that up to God now in the silence. <laughs>
invite you to stand if you're able and join us for closing doxology, which we will sing as usual a cappella. Come thou from whom all blessings flow, wake us to see more than we know. Help us claim all our gifts and power. Fill us with grace that we may flower. Come, giver of all life and peace, may we join you in earth's increase. Grant us new courage for this day. Let's just stick around after the service, grab a cup of coffee, get to know somebody new. Uh, a few announcements on the back before we part ways. A reminder of the rally happening at 1 uh, at Centennial Park. Tonight, 7 o'clock, uh, meditation group hosted by David Roman. Uh, you see the address there. The group met last Sunday and decided to come back again this week. All are welcome. Wednesday, Pub Theology, 6.30 at Grace Episcopal Church. Bring... Uh, your own beverage and open hearts for good conversation. Thursday coffee, nine o'clock at the Hayworth Hotel there in the lobby near the Big B. And uh, Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday, uh, Justice Team event, Michigan's Indigenous People Learning event happening at Outdoor Discovery Center. Space is limited. Please RSVP on the Facebook group, not only by clicking attend, but commenting you are coming and how many. And then next Sunday, we're gonna celebrate communion together. We'll be here again in person at the Civic Center. Refresh community meal a week from Wednesday. What is still needed, Joan or Amy? We have a sign-up sheet in the back. We do have a few needs, few needs yet with food. So okay. free to sign up there or on the Facebook post. Okay, great. A few needs are still in the back, and you can also sign up online. Uh, February 22 is the beginning of Lent, Ash Wednesday, and we've been invited to join with Hope Church and a few other congregations to have a combined uh, Ash Wednesday service, but also a supper together. So a chance to have a meal and a chance for a sort of a simple uh, service where you can receive the ashes and mark the beginning of the season of Lent. And there is a link. They'd like people to RSVP who are planning to eat the meal just so they can have a rough count of how many people to feed. And you can see that in the weekly email that comes out every Friday. That's at Hope Church on 10th Street, just off the river. And then, reminder, in March, we'll start meeting on Sundays at the Momentum Center. Any other announcements for the good of the whole? Yes? Volunteer sign-up sheets in the back to help with greetings, which is especially needed, or setup, or reading. Um, music. Music. Yes, great. Awesome. If you'd like to get more involved, some sign-up sheets in the back. And if you're new with us, uh, we'd love you to fill out a card, a visitor card, drop that in the basket, I was going to say the box, the basket, and we can stay connected. You can always go online to hollanducc.org to stay up to date on the latest with us. And now as you go, may you receive this blessing, which comes from the Cherokee Nation. May the warm winds of heaven blow softly upon your house. May the Great Spirit bless all who enter there. May your moccasins make happy tracks in many snows, and may the rainbow always touch your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.